Good morning everyone. Welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to the Hindu Analysis for 17th March 2024. Before I enter into the analysis, one important announcement regarding the prelims test series which is ongoing. Altogether there are 30 tests in that, both in the online as well as the offline mode and the live paper discussions would be given for that and you will also get the detailed explanation of all these tests. This is valid till 2024 May and you should get register for this or you should register for this as early as possible. Now, let us look at the news items that we have taken for today. See, first of all, let me tell you one thing very frankly. After looking at today's article, I can say that uh, today's newspaper was slightly light when it comes to news items. You all know one very important announcement was made yesterday with regards to the seven-phased poll fest to kick off on April 19th. That is the general elections 2024 we are talking about. So yesterday the uh, dates for that has been announced. So we shall look into that article. And here mostly we'll focus on three things. One, some important points that have been raised yesterday in the press conference. We'll look into them. Number two, we shall see the model code of conduct. And number third, I shall also talk about the first general elections in this. That what was the scenario then and what is the scenario now? One thing that could have been studied here, which we will not be doing today, and you do it many times in your polity, is do study about election commission. Moving to the second article, how women ha in India have fared. A small editorial and few points out of that can be taken and can be used in our essays on women empowerment. Third, with Agni 5 test, India makes the MIRV leap. Now, it came in news almost now a week back. March 11th, our Prime Minister had announced it. So, in the last few days, we have already covered it many a times, but yet another article has come and we shall see some more important points from that perspective. Apart from these three articles, there are four for the prelims bites. Number one, Indian team uses repurposed drug to treat oral cancer subtype. Again, mainly from prelims angle, we shall see the name of the technology, the name of the medicine that we shall be seeing. Number two, toy inspired engine creates power from evaporated water. So from the perspective of science, we shall see what exactly is this toy and what exactly it is going to do, which will generate your power from the evaporated water. Number third, animal husbandry department plans to register Thenmala Kulan as indigenous breed. Now, from the perspective of GS Paper 3 economics, where the economics of animal rearing is a topic, this is something that should be remembered. From Even from the angle of, uh, I would say, the animal husbandry and all, this is something that you should remember again for prelims. Fourth, starlet sea animals, animals use a neurotoxin to deter a predator. Very small article that came today, which we shall be covering. So you can see here, as you all know, Sunday is mainly full with a lot of articles that uh, that are related to science and technology. So we will be concerning ourselves to many of those articles. Now, let us begin with the first topic of the day. What's the first topic? Okay, this is not working. Okay. okay. You all can see today there were two news items. One was on the page one that uh, seven phase poll fest to kick off on April 19th. And on the page number 10, there was a chart which was giving you some numbers and some data about these electorates. So, based on this article, see, personally, let me tell you, you do not have to remember which state is going to vote on which day. But then if you are going to vote, you should know on which day you are going to vote. That much you should remember. So, nobody has to remember that in the first phase, how many seats, how many states, what is the polling date. This will not come from the UPSC's perspective. But from the general elections perspective, your voting dates, you should be knowing that. Now, if I look into this article, and when I was reading this article, I took out some important points. Number one, 
One thing is that this poll that is going to begin from April 19th, so today is March 17th, almost exactly after a month, we are going to have these elections, which would go on till June 1st. And the results for them would be announced on June 4th. Now, this is being called as the second longest poll which would be happening in seven phases for the 543 seats. This was announced yesterday by the Election Commission of India. Now here, please remember, in this article you have to remember that here when the Election Commission was making this announcement yesterday, they have also said that the state elections for four states Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, let me write, Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh, they all would be conducted simultaneously. All these four states would also be done at the same time. So along with the national elections, this also would be happening. Another very important fact that you should remember is that this is your 18th Lok Sabha election. So for the 543 members who would be elected here, this would be for the 18th Lok Sabha. These are certain points that you have to remember. Just for general knowledge, some states like West Bengal, your Bihar and UP, these are the three states where the elections would be happening in all the seven phases. Now, let us start with one by one these points. As you can see, this is the second longest poll in our history. So, which was the first one? The first general elections. Now, just for a quiz thing, I'll give you the answer. Can you tell me who was the chief election commissioner when this first elections was being conducted in our country? Anyone, please comment in the comment box. Give me two minutes, I'll be answering your this particular question. So when this first elections was happening, let me tell you, that got conducted in five months. Around September 1951 till February 1952, these elections were conducted. But in most of the textbooks, if you will see, this is mentioned that it was conducted in 1952. The reason why 1952 is mentioned is because most of the elections happened in the winter, January 1952. Even though the election totally took around five months, but then this is the case. So the first general elections was the lengthiest and this is the second lengthiest poll. Now you all can see some numbers are given. I have given, I have also pointed out few. For example, yesterday the election commission said that India has got around 96.8 crore people who are registered voters. Out of these, 49.72 are men and 47.1 are women. Along with this, some other data that was given in this article was that there are people above 85 years and the Election Commission has yesterday said that these people would be eligible to vote from their houses, from their home. Along with them, anyone who is having more than 40% disability, they will also be able to vote from their own homes. So, people who are more than 85 years of age, people who are more than 40% disabled, they can vote from their own homes. Now, give me one minute, I'll come to this point of Manipur. I'll tell you about this in some minute. Just give me some minutes. Now, in the meantime, if everybody has already commented, your first general elections, which was the lengthiest, the chief election commissioner at that moment was Sukumar Sen. So, if you have written in the comment box, great. If you have not written and you did not know, please remember it. I hope you all know who is the chief election commissioner right now, Mr. Rajiv Kumar. And a few days ago only, the two other election commissioners were appointed. One is Mr. Gyanesh Kumar and the other one is S.S. Sandhu. So these are the officers who are right now working as election commissioners. Now, along with this data, yesterday, uh, our chief election commissioner also said a few things. One of the things that he said, and I'll, I'll write in the next slide. 
one of the important points that he raised is that the gender ratio as far as the electors are concerned because i gave you the exact number that overall 96.8 49.72 male and 47.1 female but overall if you see the gender ratio between men to women our chief election commissioner says that it has gone to 948 which means it has improved significantly and yesterday in the press conference he mentioned that there are 12 states where there are more women voters compared to the men voters so these were certain numbers that he yesterday has pointed out along with this you can see here in this chart it is mentioned voters aged between 18 to 19 are around 1.84 crore which is almost equivalent to 2% of the voters similarly transgenders they are around 48000 overseas electors they are around 1.2 lakh service electors they are around 19 lakh people with disabilities already you know they can if they have more than 40% disability they can vote from home their number is around 88 lakh persons with age of more than 85 their population is 82 lakh voters who are more than 100 years of age very interesting number is 2.18 lakh and all together there would be 10 lakh 48202 polling stations nobody is asking you to remember all these numbers but when you remember one or two these data points it really makes your answers if there is ever a question on elections really wonderful now manipur why i have mentioned it separately yesterday in the press conference instead of the 543 constituencies 543 seats the election commission said that the voting would be done for 544 seats why because the constituency of outer manipur they will vote on two separate dates so chief election commissioner they said that we have got the information from the ground because of the ethnic conflict that's been going on in manipur now for almost 10 months what has happened is a lot of people they have got displaced so those displaced people they would get the chance to vote on the other day so that's why outer manipur there would be two day polling would happen for that particular constituency that's why dates have been declared for 544 seats rather than for 543 mps so this is one very peculiar fact about yesterday's declaration or information given by the election commission lastly in this article the election commissioner and i personally like this very nice words please try to remember them election commission has raised the four big problems what are those four big problems one is muscle power the you know the fact that a lot of times the i would say people who are not the correct people they are used in the election process by the netas by the mps mlas so that muscle power that is being used should not be there of course money power you know there would be a lot of seizures now for the next two months you will keep on getting that information third is misinformation i always say that please read authentic sources to gather your knowledge and fourth is mcc violations now what exactly is this mcc violations so basically this is model code of conduct yesterday the moment this announcement was made that general elections are going to happen from their moment from that moment onwards till the time this general elections results are not out this mcc is effective now what is mcc basically it's a general guideline a set of guidelines which are issued to political parties as well as the candidates about you know how their conduct should be so if you basically ask me under mcc what all comes let me tell you i said one is your general conduct 
Similarly, what they should do if they are conducting, let's say, any meetings? What should be there when any processions are carried out? If what should be their actions on the polling day? Similarly, with regards to polling booths, what would be their, you know, duties, what would be their uh, guidelines that would be here regarding observers, of course, regarding the election manifesto. So all this is there. So if any one of you ask that why are these general guidelines required? The whole logic of this is that once there is an election that has been announced, there should be a level playing field. The party which is in power in center or the party which is in power in the state, they should not use their official position for campaigning. See, for example, let's say XYZ party is in power. So they have a lot of access to a lot of things. And tomorrow, if they use these, to influence the voters or influence the voting pattern, it would give undue advantage to one political party which is in power and the others would not get the same advantage. So for example, let's say I'm a minister and I combine my official visit along with election work. So the code says this should not be done. Similarly, let's say again, if I'm a minister and I want to issue an advertisement, it should not be at the cost of public exchequer because then again, that becomes an offense. In this time period, the governments, both at the center and the states, they are advised not to appoint or make any ad hoc appointments. All this, whatever may influence the voter should not happen. Of course, along with that, no caste, no communal, you know, criteria or sentiment should be used to influence the voters. And as you know, before the election date, for almost a 48 hour period, there is, everything is banned, no prachar prasad that we call, no canvassing can be done. And this is known as election silence. So all this comes under your MCC. Now if any one of you think, is this MCC legally binding? What is the law that guides this MCC? Let me tell you very frankly, it is not legally binding. It is basically, or uh, it uh, arrived based on the consensus achieved by Election Commission of India to have a free and fair elections. So this consensus was achieved among the major political parties with regards to the do's and don'ts. So clearly remember it has got no statutory backing. So let's say even after all this let's say I made a communal comment. What can happen? Basically, anyone found guilty, sorry, guilty for this would attract a written censor from the election commission. That's the maximum that they can do, which many people say is merely a slap on the wrist. In the previous, uh, in the previous one decade, there have been many such cases where, uh, you know, and let us take example of everyone. Uh, Madam Priyanka Gandhi was accused of uh, violating this in the Madhya Pradesh polls. Similar, mis uh, similarly, Mr. Amit Shah was, you know, during 2014 Lok Sabha polls, ECI had gone to the extent of uh, enforcing e this uh, MCC and they had banned Mr. Amit Shah, our Honorable Home Minister, and another person, Mr. Azam Khan, they were banned for uh, this, uh, I would say, your, uh, what do you call this, uh, canvassing. And only when they had submitted their written speech, uh, written apologies, they were allowed. This was an extreme step taken by your Election Commission of India under Article 324. 
So these are certain things that you can remember with regards to MCC. Now the last thing that I wanted to bring here is compared to what is happening now where we are taking almost two months, our first general elections had taken almost miss, almost this five months period. Now, if you all have gone through the NCRT of post-independence, you might have read that that time when our election commission and those days election commissions used to be single membered body. They were going to conduct this. They found out that conducting a free and fair elections for a country as big as India was a humongous task. Very big, big work. Because you can understand, first of all, delimitation had to take place. Delimitation, we have studied earlier also, that is drawing of the constitutions, uh, sorry, constituencies, boundaries, boundaries. Similarly, electoral rolls had to be prepared. Electoral rolls means those citizens who are eligible to be vote, to vote, their names had to come. All this would have taken a lot of time. And very interesting, I when I take post-independence classes also, I tell, when this electoral roles were being prepared, almost 40 lakh women, their names were not proper. Why? Because let's say a lady's name was Lata. She did not give her name as Lata, but rather gave the name as wife of Mr. X or daughter of Mr. Y. So the election commission had to get these entries deleted and then again had to get them, you know, re-entered. How it was so humongous because at that point of time, almost 3,200 MLAs and 489 MPs were to be elected by almost 17 crore eligible voters. And for conducting this election at a level of India where it was being done for the first time, it was a huge, huge task. And you know, we had from day one, universal adult franchise also. So if I go according to your books, what is written in your NCRTs, somebody, an Indian editor had said that this was perhaps the biggest gamble in history. Similarly, organizer, a magazine of those days had written about Nehru that Jawaharlal Nehru would live to confess the failure of universal adult franchise in India. And so many such things were commented about the fact that maybe in India democracy would not survive. Unfortunately for those people, democracy has survived and is very healthy as far as India is concerned. With that, our first article for the day is done. Again, I am repeating three aspects. Election Commission, please study in your polity. MCC, the Model Code of Conduct would also be done over there. And comparisons with our first elections. That is something that you study in post-independence. Other than that, this article has given you some facts. Try remembering them. Moving ahead. On page 13, how women in India have fared, Dr. D. Bala Subramanyam is writing this particular article. So basically the first line only is saying that uh, your uh, International Women's Day has been celebrated on March 8th. And he is pointing out that UNDP, UNDP means United Nations Development Program, they come up with their one index. What is the name of their index? Gender Social Norms Index. What does this do? This norm index, this quantifies all the sorts of biasness that is against women basically on four parameters. What are those parameters? Political, educational, economic and physical integrity. Now, in this article, one of the facts that they mentioned, and I, I could not check this, but I would like to definitely check. The uh, I'll take this red color. You can see here, one point I have not mentioned here, it is written. 
of the 8 billion people across the world, 45% are women. Now, I like to check this data. You all also can check this data. That is this such a big gap? Means I could not believe that if there are altogether, sorry, 8 billion people in the world, only 45% of them are women. I am slightly, you know, I would like you people to do some research on your own. This point you should think that, you know, usually we, what do we say? 49, 51, 49 50.5, 50.5, this small difference. But if we consider 45% women, we are saying that there are 55% men, which looks to be a very big, big gap. So I'm not really sure about this particular thing. Do check on your own and do comment in the comment box. Do you think that the women are only 45% when it comes to the entire world population? That is something that you can think about this. Now, if again I come back to this. I was going through this report which is not mentioned in this article. And based on that what I found out was that this report covers 85% of the global population. And out of that, it was found out that 9 out of 10 men and women have fundamental biasness against women. Now, what is the fundamental biasness? I'll give you a few examples. For example, almost half of the world, they believe men make better political leader. Of course, we are comparing it to the women. Similarly, if you see here, another biasness. Almost two out of the five people believe that men are better business executives. Again, compared to women. So you can see here, these are certain types of biasness that you have already formed a mentality that see in this thing, Men would be better than the women. And two examples are given. Let me assure you one thing very clearly that this biasness can be seen in the countries with both the low HDIs as well as high HDIs. So definitely this biasness is nothing but a global issue. This is a global issue. This biasness is there across the countries. Now, I've got some numbers for you. Please see here. In India, in this article, they have spoken about India. And the good thing about India is that in the last two decades, thanks to the right to education, universal ed uh, education, uh, these things, what has happened is we have provided free education to all children, whether poor, rich, rural, urban, and this is being provided in all our territories. And out of many of these, almost 12 crore are children who are girls. So that's a good thing. So this article praises India on account of the fact that we are providing this free education to all the children, which clearly represents that India is providing or is having inclusive policies. But then... Here it also mentions that if you go to the higher education, there is a difference in the sense that if you look at the girls and if you look at the boys, girls mostly opt for arts and science, nursing or let's say medical science, medicine. While boys in their undergraduate and the postgraduate degrees they go for computer science and at the PhD levels, they go for digital technology. So in, based on this article, I've taken two facts here. It is mentioned in the STEM. I hope you all know the full form of STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So in this article, it is mentioned in the STEM institutes, only 20% candidates are females. Similarly, they are mentioned even amongst the faculty members in IIT, CSIR labs, AIMS, IISERs, IIMs, only 20% are 
women so this is something that has to be looked into apart from that here another place where we have been praised is with regards to our political history here the comparison has been done to us so they are mentioning that for example in us the president of the us first president was george washington he was sworn in 1789 and from there onwards there have already been 46 presidents as far as us is concerned but of them how many are women zero none of them have ever become the president even next president also would not be a woman because most probably donald trump and mr biden would be fighting over there nikki haley could not win the primaries to fight in the elections similarly if you remember last to last time hillary clinton had lost to donald trump so till then till now none of the women candidates have become a president as far as us is concerned but compared to them if you look at india two out of our 15 presidents madam pratibha patil and present president madam draupadi murmu they both are women so in this article they are he is also mentioning not only think about india but even look at our uh, you know neighborhood in pakistan for example you had benazir bhutto similarly of course she is dead but she was the prime minister for a very long period of time as far as pakistan was concerned if you look at bangladesh you have <coughs> sorry sheikh hasina wajid she is the current prime minister of bangladesh in nepal vidya devi bhandari was the second president of nepal so such names have been given even for tibbat the women prime minister between 1991 to 2011 her name being dolma gyari is mentioned similarly so many other latin american countries and all they have had women prime ministers presidents where they are saying that see in some aspects we are doing much better than the others now why it is being mentioned please remember i have said very clearly that this is a global issue gender biases are there both in the low as well as high hdi countries these biases are across regions they are across incomes they are across the levels of developments they are across the different different culture so overall it's a global issue now personally i don't think very 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 important article you will get so many such articles at different different places but considering today's newspaper i said not many articles to be covered i had taken this one come to the third one now again a article that's a repetitive article a article which you have already done in the last few days now if you see here i have taken the crux of this article number 1 in this article there is a mention of mission divyastra now you all know last week around march 11th our prime minister had announced on social media that there has been a successful flight test of the agni 5 ballistic missile now what it had it also had multiple independently targetable reentry vehicle technology now please understand this only is known as m i r sorry v m i r v multiple independently targetable reentry vehicle and this is being done by drdo that is defense research and development organization under the mission divyastra so with this success that india has achieved india has become a band of a very selective countries in the world which are those countries countries like usa ussr uk france which all have this technology under which they can use a single missile to deliver multiple nuclear warheads that's the thing so if anyone is know uh, is uh, interested in knowing what exactly is mirv in this article 
it's mentioned that MIRV, it's like a missile bus in, in simplest, limest term. It's like a missile bus where there are many passengers and all these passengers are like nuclear bombs. So now, once this bus is operated, it facilitates a single booster to deliver them to different, different targets. So different passengers, which are different nuclear bombs, they can be sent to different, different targets. So you can hit different targets with only one of these. So India has also achieved this through Mission Divyastra. Now, two important things here. One thing, again, for the women empowerment, do you remember that the project director for this also is a woman and had a lot of significant contribution from women in this. Where was this experiment done? It was done on APJ Abdul Kalam Island, which is there in Odisha. And the mission had achieved all the parameters. Now, we are not going into technical details, but this has been mentioned. Now, if you see beyond this, and let me change the pen color, you can see I have written here, Minutemen 3, Poseidon. Now, what exactly are these? And if I take separate one. See, number one, first country to achieve this was in 1970, United States of America. They had used Minutemen, or they had deployed Minutemen 3, and this was the first... MIRV intercontinental ballistic missile which had three warheads on it. In 1971, they later deployed Poseidon, which is mentioned in the previous one. Now, what is the difference in Minutemen 3 and Poseidon? Poseidon was basically used for the submarines. So this was basically the first MIRV led submarine launched ballistic missile. Submarine launched ballistic missile SLBM. Now once US had done, USSR had to do it. So later in the 70s only Soviet Union because then the erstwhile USSR, they also did and they acquired this technology. They had the technology that could have hit targets as far as 1500 kilometers in those days. Later, UK and France also achieved these technologies. After this, China, which continuously expanded its technology, also got this. So, as you can see here, Minutemen 3 and Poseidon, these are the, I would say, the uh, uh, these technologies which were used by USSR, uh, sorry, USA and India is now in this particular group. Last part of this article they have talked about that Mission Divyastra, why it is significant? It is significant for all these reasons. You all know in 1998 we had conducted nuclear tests under Pokhran 2. Because the first Pokhran was done in mid-70s during the tenure of Madam Indra Gandhi. So now in 1998 when Atal Bihari Vajpayee was our Prime Minister, at that moment we had conducted our second nuclear test. Later in 2003, we declared that our nuclear doctrine was based on a no first use policy. And it was reserved or, and it reserved the right to massive retaliation in case it was attacked first. We made it very, very clear that we are not developing these technologies to hit anyone. But then if we are attacked, we would be using this. So with the addition of this MIRV technology and this missiles which are going to be used by this, our potency has increased by multiple times with regards to Mission Divyastra. So that's your third article, again a repetitive article that has come many times in the last few days. Now the four other articles which are there for prelims that I have taken, they all are related to somehow to science and environment. If you see here in the page 13, you can see here this article came, Indian team uses repurposed drug to treat oral cancer subtype. Now, a very lengthy article, as you all can see. So, I decided to take out only the most relevant portion here. 
So the basic thing here is that a Mumbai based researchers, they have identified a noble fusion transcript. This is for treating both the head as well as neck cancer patients. Along with this fusion transcript that is to be used, they have also found out that a FDA approved deworming drug that's called pyrivinium pemodate can also be used to treat such cancer. Please remember both these things. Now, there is only one more thing. Give me some minutes, I'll tell you. Now, this you have to remember that this is a drug which is used to treat these types of cancer. Now, if you come to fusion transcript and I'll be writing it with, okay, I'm sorry. I'll be writing it with FT here. Now, in this article, they have explained what exactly is FT. So, they are saying FT is when there are small segments of two chromosomes, they exchange their positions. Now, you all can understand. If the chromosomes, they are exchanging their positions, it would re lead to realignment or rearrangement of the structure of the chromosomes. So, they have given an example that let's say two chromosomes 6 and 18 are involved and there is a realignment. So, chromosome number 6 would have small segment of chromosome 18 and chromosome 18 would have small segment of chromosome 6. Now, because of this exchange that has happened between these two chromosomes, two different genes, two different genes, they are brought together at the point where the segments, they both meet and thus it leads to emergence of a fusion transcript. So, if anyone asks you what exactly is FT, in FT basically there are small segments of chromosomes that exchange their positions or do a realignment which leads to this technology. Now, under this article only, they have mentioned one more point that's your fusion transcript and you all can see UBE3C LRP5. So, based for this particular type of cancer patients, they are saying that the researchers from Mumbai, they have got this technology where relocation or the translocation involvement would be there with regards to chromosome 11 and chromosome 7. So the researchers from Mumbai, they have identified if chromosome 11 and 7, they both have some sort of relocation. It can be used to cure this sort of diseases. Lastly, because this was all about oral cancer, one point that you should remember, oral cancer is the most predominant form of cancer as far as Indian patients are concerned with every year around 2 lakh cases being reported. Every year 2 lakh cases get reported because of this oral cancer. So few facts about prelims that you have to remember. Rest, If you want to read it, you can read it but then it's a very lengthy article and uh, go through it but then I personally feel this is the most important things that you should remember. Moving ahead, there is another article on the same page. Toy inspired engine creates power from evaporated bird, uh, sorry, water. Now, this is the picture of a toy. Uh, in this article, it is written that it is used in a lot of experiments in the classrooms. Trust me, when I was growing up, I never used this sort of experiment. But then if you see here, this is a classic drinking bird toy. This is that example of the toy. This technology is being used by the scientists from Hong Kong to create power from evaporated water. This is also known as Dippy Bird. And you can see under this uh, uh, discovery that they have made, engines 
convert energy from water evaporation into electricity to power small electronics. So what exactly is this? First of all, scientists from Hong Kong and then other scientists from China, they have discovered this. Under this, their device can generate outputs which exceed 100 volts and can operate with a very small water capacity only 100 milliliter and can work for many many days now this is based on the this toy also known as dippy bird now what exactly in this if i change the pen color and if i take let's say let's say black you all can see here this toy has two bulbs one is here and of course the other one is here and these two bulbs have also got very high volatile liquid which is stored in it now this high volatile liquid is methylene chloride now top side of the uh, your uh, this thing uh, bulb you can see has been slightly modified with a hat and a peak of your bird so it has been given a decorative top to make it like a what do you call toy now in this this bird's head has to be dipped into water once this bird's head is dipped into the water the water starts evaporating Now, of course, you can see just again, this is for uh, uh, toy purpose. They are suspended with two plastic legs. And because of the water evaporation, there is a pressure difference that causes the liquid which is in the downward side of this tube to rise until it fills the head, again causing this to go down to have some drink or the water to uh, to consume the water again again no need to remember this whole technology nobody is again going to ask you but then do remember that this is a technology that is being used this technology's use is mainly for the fact that this will convert energy from water evaporation into electricity moving ahead to the second last topic uh, I've taken under, under the economy, the animal rearing thing. Animal husbandry department plans to register Tenmala Kulan as indigenous breed. Please remember Tenmala Kulan. This name you should remember. It's a unique indigenous breed. As you can understand, who is taking or who is doing this? Kerala Animal Husbandry Department is working for this. You can see the image is also given here. It's a dwarf cow. And locally in Kerala and all, it's known as Tenmala Kulan. Now, this cow has many distinctive features like a small hump. And the local tribal people, both in Aripa and Tenmala, they are using or they are rearing this cow. Now, two places, Aripa and Tenmala, if any one of you is from Kerala, do comment. You can see both of them are very famous for ecotourism, both these places. And they both are in Kerala, where exactly, do comment in the comment box. But let me tell you, these cows are very docile. They thrive on forest-based fodder. Now, when I was reading on this article, I found out that there are many indigenous breeds as far as cows as well as buffaloes are concerned with regards to India. Almost around 50 such breeds. And again, it's almost practically impossible for you to remember every of those. For example, today I got to know that there is a breed known as Purnia that's there in Bihar. Similarly, in this article only they have written that in Kerala presently there are other indigenous breeds like Vechur, Kasar Gold, Dwarf, these all are different different types of uh, 
your indigenous breeds that are found in Kerala presently. So that's mentioned. Last thing that's very very important that was there in this article. They have mentioned that this particular animal. They produce mineral rich A2 milk. But the problem is that the quantity of the milk produced by them is very very low. And that's why they are mostly reared for calves as well as for manure purpose. Other than this, they have very good immunity. They are very strongly built. But then the supply of milk is very, very low as far as these animals are concerned. Last article for the day. One very small paragraph. This is solid sea anemones use a neurotoxin to deter a predator. Now what exactly is this starlet sea anemones? This is the picture of this anemones. So please see here, in this article you have to just remember where exactly these are found. Not in India, they are mostly found along the eastern coast of North America. Now what do they do? They secret a specific neurotoxin which is used as its venom. Why do they, you know, secret it? Because that's very very vital for its defenses against a main predator. That's your grass shrimp. So to safeguard themselves against the grass shrimp, these people use this neurotoxin as their venom. So this is the small creature about which this article had come again just for prelims. Remember one line, nothing more than that. Moving ahead, if you see the two main questions, the one, discuss the various challenges related to elections in India. Think about the challenges that would be there. And the second one, many issues of the country would get sorted if there is more women empowerment. Comment on this particular remark. So with that, we are done with the discussions. Very few articles today which should be considered for this, uh, you know, our analysis. Two articles that you could have done beyond this were covered by us in the earlier classes. One was on Kachativu Island and another one was on the sickle cell anemia, which we have considered and covered in the earlier classes also. Beyond this, personally, I'll tell you for the next few days or till the elections are not done, there would be a lot of articles which are related to politics, which would not be that much important from our UPSC's perspective. So keep on reading the newspapers. But I think for some time, the articles would be very limited to, let's say, polity, uh, you know, because the government would not be working right now in the sense that the focus would be on elections and, you know, MCC is there. Similarly, there would be less bilateral talks and all that. If there is, we are always going to cover them on the same platform, same place, same time. Till then, please like the initiatives, please comment on them and please subscribe to our channel. That's all from today's lecture. Thank you. Goodbye.